I try to make sure I watch it every Easter. It's uh, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, you know, and he stands there, let my people go out of my cold, dead hands. Oh, no, 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 that's his NRA speech. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get those things confused, right? So, uh, so Charlton Heston is, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but he's leading the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. Right, and so how is uh, how is Dr. King? Why, why is he using those metaphors? And and what relationship does he see the struggle he's engaged with? What's the relationship with with those biblical stories? Is there a relationship between those biblical stories? Yes, sir. Um, I guess they're kind of coming, they're coming out of slavery, kind of in a similar way. And they're kind of stuck in the desert where they have been out of slavery, but they're not like completely free yet. Okay. Is when they're free of persecution. So here's a question: um, Who was the leader that helped to get people out of the land of Egypt and on their way to the Promised Land? Moses. It was Moses, right? Um, and <clears throat> when Moses is leading them out of out of the Promised Land, does Moses make it to the Promised Land? No. No, no. he never makes it to the Promised Land, but he does go to the mountain. Right. And he sees some things that the people don't necessarily see. And so what Dr. King is saying is, I, I know that I may not see the day that this happens. I may not make it to the promised land. But you will. And so what I find interesting is that the children of Israel, they they uh, they, they end up, you know, Moses is not able to make it into the promised land. They get to the edge of the promised land and they send in some spies to check it out. And they send two groups of spies. The, the first is, is with Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb go into the promised land and they say, this is the land of milk and honey. There are grapes the size of a man's head. Hand, rather. This is exactly what we've been waiting for. Let's go do it. But the other team of spies came back and said, yeah, there is milk and honey and there are really big grapes. But there are also monsters in that land and giants in that land. And so being an optimistic people, what, who do, who do the, uh, the children of Israel follow? Who do they listen to? Who do they take advice from at, and say, you know, we want you to be our leaders because you are also positive thinkers. So who do they elect to take them into the promised land? Right? So Joshua and Caleb take the people into the promised land. And so they're working with the people. And, um, and they start having these challenges now that they're in this promised land. I mean, everything that they've asked for is there. It takes a little bit of work. But people are, are complaining and murmuring to Joshua and Caleb. And they're saying, Joshua and Caleb, when Moses was here, he had manna falling from the heavens. Joshua and Caleb, when Moses was here, he would take dirty water and throw a tree in it and make it sweet for us to drink. When Moses was here, we had quail coming out of our noses. We had a pillar of fire and of smoke. Joshua and Caleb, why aren't you doing that? <laughs> And so what did Joshua and Caleb do? They had a leadership challenge. And what Joshua and Caleb did was they brought all the people together and they said, we just want to remind you of something. Moses is dead. What's the implication of that? That Moses is dead. Why, why would that, as, a, as, as leaders of this nation, why would it be important for the new leadership to remind these people that, that their old leader is dead. <clears throat> That's not rhetorical. Why is that important? For the new leadership to remind the old folks who were part of that old movement that that leader is dead. Why is that important? So, they can move on. so that they can move on. Dr. King is dead. And I, 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 I say that in, in a respectful way. I, I don't want to dishonor his death. I don't dishonor all the things that he did. But his way of doing things, that time has passed. 
Will there be another Dr. Martin Luther King? No. His, his DNA, his genetics were for the time that they were in. There will be no other Dr. King. Will there be another Gandhi? There will never be another Gandhi. Will there be another Mother Teresa? There will never be another Mother Teresa. Will there be another you? One of the things that, that um, you know, Western society has really done is we've really gotten a hold of this, you know, rugged individualism kind of, you know, I can do this myself and I'm not a part of a context. But we are all a part of a context. Other people's liberation is in our mouths. We see people on the street, we see things happening, and we choose to say something or we don't. Each and every one of you sitting in this room is somebody's Dr. Martin Luther King. Somebody is relying on you to stand up at a crucial time, put it on the line, whatever that line is and whatever you've got to put on it. Somebody is, is, is asking and looking for your ability to stand up and speak for them when they can't speak for themselves. Moses is dead. It's our job to go and take the land. It's our job to, to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves and not just be maternalistic or paternalistic, but to encourage and strengthen and create opportunities for folks. And that's what you'll be doing when you start working with, with these, these new folks coming in. So you get to be a liberator. And it will come at a cost, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, bah, 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 bah. You guys gonna need all that stuff. So I, um, I spent a large part of my career, my adult career, uh, working for uh, government. So I worked for a county uh, institution, and we talked a lot about discrimination and harassment, right? And so there are laws that dictate how we are to, to act with one another, right? So is it right or wrong to discriminate? Wrong? Okay, well, well, we'll talk about that. There are, uh, there are rules and laws. Um, so uh, discrimination is broken into to, to two parts when we talk about organizations. There is um, harassment, which we'll spend a little more time talking about. There's retaliation, that's when a, 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 an individual or an organization tries to get back at somebody for telling on them. Right? You know, snitches get stitches. Ever heard that? No? Okay. Right? So, uh, so that, that's retaliation. Uh, harassment is broken into these categories. There's uh, race or color. There is gender or sexual orientation. There is religious or lack of religious uh, bigotry. There is uh, age or disability. And then there is um, long-term and, and short-term disability kinds of stuff. So like breaking a leg or being pregnant can be a, 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 a short-term disability. So that stuff is working that way. Um, what are some of the things that, that give us the teeth to have diversity kind of conversations? What gives us the, uh, not just the moral imperative, but the legal standing in which to, to have these kind of conversations? Some of those things are the Declaration of Independence, uh, the US Constitution, uh, the the uh, 1865 13, 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. Um, in 1920, the Women's uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act. And then the 1991, and I apologize for the typo, the 1991 ADA Act allows us to really have this diversity conversation. Something that I found very interesting was that the, uh, the 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865. 1865. The Civil Rights Act happened in 1964. So for over a hundred years, the slaves were free, but they couldn't participate in everyday society. So if you ever encounter a, a, a black person or African American person and they're a little bit cranky, give them another hundred years and they'll get over it. Right? 
So 100 years is a long time not to be able to be a part of the nation that you pay taxes in, that you raise your children in, so forth and so on. So, uh, so discrimination. But now we have laws that protect us and, uh, and they govern us. So um, it is obvious that since we have laws, there is no more discrimination. <laughs> is that true? No, it's not true. So I had to go back to the drawing board because I was curious as to, you know, we have these laws, but why do we still have these problems? And so I want to explore that stuff with each and every one of you. All right, cool. So before we get to this part of the presentation, I'm going to pass out some stuff. Do you guys have stuff to write with? Pencils and pens? All right, cool. Yeah. Everyone have one? Super. So what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to open it up and you will find uh, five green circles. Do you see the five green circles? What I'd like for you to do is I want you to put one thing that you value in each one of those circles. All right? So one thing that you value. It could be a concept like uh, world peace or, uh, or liberty. Uh, it could be a person. Um, a family member, a, a niece or nephew, it could be um, a thing, a car, a, a house, blah, blah, blah. One thing that you value in each one of those green circles. All right? One thing that you value in each one of those green circles. you value in each one of those circles. Two is a great start. One, I don't have to cheat either. And it's not cheating if you look at somebody else's game. <laughs> but we would hope that you'd have your own values. All right. So as I look around, it looks like most people had at least four. So we'll get started on the next part. What I'd like for you to do is I want you to, uh, we're going to play a game. And the game is very simple. What I'd like for you to do is I want you to find two people who share, who may have on their paper the same thing you have, or they agree with what you have on your paper. Right? So two people for each one of those. And I want them to put their initials in the circle that they agree with or that they share, right? So if one person says nephew and another person says family, that's, that's pretty close. That's a, that's a pretty close match, okay? So what I'd like you to do is I want you, in the time that I give you, I want you to find two people for each one of your values, all right? Any questions before we get started? All right, I will give you two minutes starting now. 